I don't stand around in there, trust me. <laughs> It's a strange way to salve your phone signals. I miss phone signals a lot. You miss it? A lot. Yeah. Really? What do you miss about it? The people. Everybody's nice. Everybody's. Oh. Oh. It's a different. It's a different world. As opposed to us, Randy. Yeah, Apparently, we're not nice. <laughs> tease you very much. I, I, that one just kind of <laughs> leapt to mind. It was over. <laughs> <laughs> like double doors. Yeah. <laughs> the woman that sits in the back of the church, the elderly lady. Yeah. What's her name? Mar uh, Marilyn? Marilyn? That's the one came to the best. Yes. No. Yes. That's who it came from. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn, Marilyn gave me the Philippos. Oh, very nice. Marilyn really? Philippone, yeah. Oh, the other day at Bud was sending him that on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's I very hope nice. The camera wasn't on when I was <laughs> Yeah, we're, re we're, we're streaming. Dance for us. We're, we're streaming live now, so don't worry okay. about it. Have been for about three minutes. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Hello. Hi, Rochelle. Who else? Hi, Susan. Anyone Lucy. else living? I'm just going to. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. I don't think I've met him. Hi, Joanne. I got her. Yes. Okay. First heard Bill about his outings. Did you ever see him go to Fargo? No, I don't know him. The movie is called Fargo. Okay. It's 90 miles from Grand Forks, North Dakota. Where Sorry, we were procrastinating. <laughs> yeah. Watch it, and then you'll know. That the is right, right word, right? Watch Fargo. Yes, it is. <laughs> I gotta ask her to make sense. That's all right. There are days when I feel like I'm gonna be late for my own funeral. Oh my gosh. For sure you betcha. Well, you know, that's okay. <laughs> Somebody asked me I don't mind it being delayed, but I should be there when I when it arrives. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, they said, uh, when it comes to your funeral and you're laid out in that casket, what would you like somebody to say about you? I said, I would like somebody to go walking up, look down at me and say, oh my God, he's breathing. What a dreamer. I guess that embalming fluid worked. <laughs> it's, get, it's, get, it's get worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny, Jim. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, Let's, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, seems like it's just been a, a fast-paced and tough few weeks. And, and um, I just ask, Father, that as, as we go into this Bible study this morning, you would, you would um, give me the words, give me the Give me the right words. Give me, work through them. Let them be yours. Let them be what you would have me to teach. Thank you, Father, for, it's a beautiful time of the year. Um, it's one of my favorite times of the year, and I just thank you for it. I ask that you would bless this time. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. How are you? Real good. good. Morning. How are you? Well, everybody had their coffee this morning. That's awesome. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Did you import it from North Dakota? Maybe. Never mind. All right, so. <laughs> no, we have hot coffee. Yeah. Oh, okay. As, as opposed to iced coffee. Nice <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, sticking to. Sticking to the lesson at this point. Um, so up to this point, 
the gospel and its ministry, as expounded by Paul, is shown to be superior to the law and its ministry. And we see that uh, from chapters 1, 16 through about 6, verse 10. We saw in Paul's ministry, the message has not been corrupted. It's more glorious than that of the law. It gives more glory to God, and it looks at the eternal rather than the temporal. It goes on to declare several new things for the believer in Christ, a number of blessings that we have in salvation that weren't there prior to this. In the first 10 verses of chapter 6, we will see that Paul's message in ministry is with Christ. We will see that his serving is serving through grace, serving in a large number of situations. He also served with certain standards and under many conditions. That would take us through verse 10, and that kind of wraps up the first roughly half of this book. In verse 1 of chapter 6, 2 Corinthians, so that you don't have to ask there. See, I've been working on it. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at a favorable time I listened to you, and on a day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. Giving no reason f- for taking offense in anything, so that the ministry will, be not, will not be discredited. I know there's a comma there, but I'm going to stop. Because I really want to work through that one. There's a, actually a fair amount there. Working together with him. Who is him? Christ. Okay. You know, sometimes stepping back and looking at who is the antecedent of this pronoun? Who's, who's, who's it referring to? Well, this goes back to the last three verses. It does. It does. This is why I don't necessarily always like chapter breaks. Sometimes they, if we're not paying attention, they interrupt. they interrupt. That's a great way to say it there. Working together with Christ, we also urge you, we, we beg of you. It's, it's, more, it's more than just urge. You know, we, we sometimes urge each other to do something. We urge Jim to slow down. Um, well, that one just slipped right out there. Um, but this is this is this is more than that. This this is more urgent. If I want to play off that word urge, it has the idea of of begging you. I implore you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, what would that be referring to? See, I'm gonna I'm gonna start asking questions instead of just telling you something. Trying to change my style here a little bit, <laughs> Alice. I've always looked at it in, in when he, he's putting out um, a call. He he has gone through and explained how God worked through Christ to reconcile us for the ministry of reconciliation. Okay. So if I were to receive the grace of God, accept that salvation, and then just sit around and do nothing with it, that would be in vain. Okay. Okay. And, and you're right. And, and, and what I really wanted to draw out of this is that this is not talking about their salvation because he's already talking to saved, part, saved people in the church of Corinth. Okay? So this can't be a reference to receiving the grace unto salvation. No. Um, no, this is what you're doing with your time. This is what you're doing with it. Are we pew warmers? Are we sitting back and just basking in the fire insurance or are we doing something for our Lord and Savior exactly verse 2 is 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 a, is, is a should be in parentheses if we wanted to write it in English and think about it I beg of you not to receive the grace of God in vain for he says okay and I'm going to jump over that that's actually a a loose quote from Isaiah 49.8, but I'm going to jump over that, and I want to read 
verse 1, then verse 3, and then go back to the, to, to the verse 2 parenthetical. And working together with Christ, we beg of you not to receive the grace of God in vain, giving no reason for taking for anyone taking offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited. For, he says, at a favorable time I listened to you, and on a day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. Do you see how that, that really, I think, pulls it together a lot better? Glad everybody agreed. So Paul then goes on in verses 4 and 5 to talk about uh, serving in many situations. But in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in difficulties, in beatings, in imprisonments, in mob attacks, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger going to stop us there even though the list is not complete because I really do believe that the, that first half is different from the second half. And but it, the reason to suffer is because we're going to go through that. Or may. Or may. Uh, or may. Absolutely. But in everything, and Paul certainly did go through it, uh, in everything commending ourselves, not just most things, and I have to admit, I, I, I get to going in things, and I do trust what God has shown me in Scripture to guide my thinking through situations too much. And then I don't stop and pray. I, I admit it. Uh, it's it's something that God's working on in my heart. Um, I think we all do that to an extent. We do, yeah. which is why I'm bringing it. I'm not just confessing all of my faults here. I, I admit that. Although I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have plenty no, of. We, we all do it, and until we get into those positions and see how we're going to react, we really don't know how we're going to. And it, sometimes we do need to just step back and pray about it before we do react. If I just react, normally it's the wrong way to react. As I become more Christ-like, I see my reactions becoming more Christ-like and better. Yes. Okay. But so many times after the fact, I look back and go, oh, okay, so I didn't do anything wrong, but when did I stop and acknowledge that it was God's wisdom that was guiding me, yes. you know, uh, and, and too often, I'm afraid I don't. <clears throat> um, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, as bond slaves of God, in much endurance, continuing under the, under the pressures, under the stress. <laughs> All right. I guess I'm not going to leave it up there. I think this is why he mentioned this first. Because these hardships are the ones that we have the hardest time going through and allowing God to work in us. It's so much easier when everything's perfect, like the next group, and nice and working together to actually stay in God's will. It's so hard to be you know, at war with the world and stay keep that calm coolness that God would like us to be when we're dealing with things. Yeah. Calm like a duck on water, but paddling like the living daylights underneath. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jim. I hadn't even thought of it that way. So, but he's he's talking about endurance. This idea of of continuing on and on, and you're tired and you're weary and and you endure. Okay. Um, in if in afflictions. This is the I, this carries the idea of being under pressure by others, okay? Uh, not circumstances, but others. So there's people involved in this. In hardships, I, I, we don't need to define some of these things. In difficulties, in beatings, 
And Paul dealt with that physically a lot. literally being beat and at one point even being stoned for, for preaching the gospel. In imprisonments, when we think of Paul in prison, we generally think of his two or three main, main imprisonments, but quite frankly from other passages, while it's not detailed, he clearly did a lot of overnighters and a, a lot of one-week stints in prison where where he he, spent a lot of time in prison. he he did he did you know if we were we if we were uh, anywhere near him we we'd have an overpopulation problem in our prisons from Christians. Hmm. I wonder how that would affect recidivism. It is it is so much for recidivism though. Yeah. Not yeah. to make not to make light of a serious issue, but there might be another. Sure. Can't you? Yeah. Sure. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's what yeah. she said. Okay. So, so yeah. Paul had to go to prison because he needed to get fed. And uh, by feeding, meaning that he would be feeding others. Passing right. Passing on the word of Christ. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that's an important point that Paul often brings out. It's like, this is why you keep going through it. Because right. God is in it. And you'll see. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and we see that from the Philippian jailer. I'll get to you in just a second. Uh, we see that with the Philippian jailer. Well, we we have a whole church, and one of the I yeah, believe yeah. the most mature church shown in New Testament because Paul and Silas were imprisoned, right? Uh, and and moving right on into the modern day, we don't have nearly that kind of uh, persecution yet. Uh, I will say yet. I think it's coming. Some countries we do. Yeah, sure. But when you start step out of the United States, we do see a lot of of nations around the world where being a Christian is sub- subjecting you to some very, very harsh imprisonments and or death. Yeah. Uh, and it's growing. It's not it's not being beaten back. And I'm not gonna jump off onto a whole new th- theology topic about that, but uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs is an interesting read. Gail, you had something. In Paul's later writings, he tells people who are considering becoming Christians, it's just about, before they make that step, it's just about what happens because there is a consequence if you turning away and went back to their life, they would face the consequence of it was better that they not taste the goodness of the God and walked away because there's a special consequence for that person who takes this step of faith. Okay, absolutely. Um, there, there is going to be a significant consequence for Christians who accept Christ and then basically spurn the gift by living for themselves. Um, absolutely. Um, I think it's one of the reasons that, that Paul so emphasized the eternal instead of the temporal. Excuse me. Even through this passage, time and time and time again, trying to show them how this is better than the law, which refuted some of the Judaizers and some of the other things that he continually had to fight, but at the same time tries to focus them off of the now and into the future. Because I guess we all all know the analogy that if you're you're watching all the 
all the land you got to cross to get to a to a water hole while you're when you're thirsty all you think about is the obstacle but if you see the water hole and keep your eyes on the water hole it isn't it isn't nearly as big a deal again spiritually speaking he t- said time and time again look at Christ look at Christ look at Christ absolutely <coughs> yeah Peter when he walked on water you're right when he took his eyes off Christ guess what the water started winning you're right um, in beatings in, in imprisonments in mob attacks that's an interesting one in, it, it literally means instabilities or riots and we do see that occurring some in, in scripture in labors toiling to the point of weariness I'm not talking being tired I'm talking weariness um, in sleeplessness and this has a couple of ideas behind that phrase. It can mean standing watch, either because of danger, and we would think of a sentinel or, or someone watching from a city gate or, or a city wall in that time. But it can also, it also has a need to continue to work in spite of the weariness and kind of ties back into endurance there. Um, and then in hunger, again, kind of two aspects to that. One is when Paul didn't have enough food to, to eat because churches had not been supplying for him the way they were supposed to. But the other one is when he fasted, when he chose to abstain from food. And, it w- and the scriptural context throughout the Bible for that is when we're focusing on spiritual things rather than and the food is not important. So we don't even go into eating because the, the, the spiritual watching and prayer is more important. All of that's packed into verses 4 and 5. And we could spend way too much time on that and the applications for us. But I do want to challenge you to be thinking about some of these things. How many times do we lose sleep because we're working? But how many times do we lose sleep because we're praying? I don't know. Those are, those are personal answers. Please don't, please don't answer. Um, in verses 6 through v- verse 8a, before I move on, anybody got any questions or thoughts about that? Verses 6 through 8a, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in the word of truth, and in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as regarded as deceivers and yet true as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and yet behold we are alive, as punished and yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. The the idea, jumping all the way back to the beginning of verse 6, in, in verses 4 and 5, he's talking about serving with certain standards. But starting in verse, excuse me, in many situations. But in verse 6, he starts talking about standards. It's, it's, it's less external upon us and more internal uh, as, and less physical, maybe, I should say. In purity, this has the idea of being blameless. It's a purity of life, morally pure. In knowledge, uh, I, I really believe this word knowledge is, is knowledge of the truth of God, knowledge of the word of God, knowledge of what's happening around us rather than sticking to our proverbial head in the stand. How many times 
have you ever heard the phrase, someone being so spiritually minded they're no earthly good? Well, if you haven't, you just did. Okay. <laughs> there, there are people who, who just seem clueless about, people, uh, about, about the things going on around them. And I, they're usually God-fearing, loving people. I'm not, not talking them down. But I see in the book of James how we're supposed to make our faith practical. Okay, practical to the to the trials and tribulations and, and hurts and aches and pains around us. And if we can't see that and help that, then what good are we? And, and that, I just, yeah, I just preached the whole book of James as far as I'm concerned, but <laughs> pretty much, yeah. yeah. Wednesday. Oh, huh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> But, it, but it's the idea that, I'm, that I, I really believe b- b- comes into this is that if you're not aware of, of the things going, I'm not talking about the news. I'm talking about people. Always focus on people and how can we present the gospel. And if they are so caught up in their attention in whatever trial they're going through, We've got to minister to that trial, that trouble, that, that, that distraction so that we can get past the physical to the spiritual. Classic, Jesus at, at, and the woman at the well. Okay, She came there for water, physical water. We know that the human body can't go without it for very long. Okay, What did he do? He used that as an object lesson to show her a greater need that she didn't even know about. Having a little fun with it. The Bible never did tell us whether or not she actually got any water. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Um, Yes, Alice. Great. Yeah, it has to yeah. be consistent. Yeah, it's Great so tie in. Get off on a tangent on your food bank is a great example, and it's one thing that we are constantly working on, always, you know, because it's, it's we're feeding people and we love it, but we're feeding people for God. This is our service to God, and we have to make sure that that is understood. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Yes. I, I, anyway, I, I think that I, I can't add to that, but going back to in knowledge, I really think all of that is wound up in this. Uh, in patience, the idea of forbearance or, or fortitude. I think patience is overrated, uh, is underrated in our society. Um, Now Alice is preaching at me. So now, well, if the shoe fits, right? Patience is tough. It is tough. Patience is a tough one. And that's a hard one for me because, you know, our job is really to plant the seed and be patient and let God nurture it and help it to grow and be there when needed. And you want it to grow. Um, You want to see results. And you've got to be patient because we don't know how long it's going to take God to actually presentation so that because they're watching us every time we do that it. consistent presentation yeah. absolutely Ab- hope not because mom you're going to be running for a long time 
sometimes I correct myself and I'll, just, I'll, I'll be thinking, I know God brought him to me. Why? And there's often I'll say, maybe it's just to irritate me. I don't know, but I'm here for a reason. I need to write it out. And then we've seen one guy, it took like 10 years. And now he's lost his soul. But we had to write a piece that said 10 years. And it's tough sometimes to be patient. And I found out many years ago, do not pray for patience. <laughs> Don't pray for patience. You, you, God will give it to you. Uh, you know, and, and taking that a little bit further, but the idea of patience, uh, long suffering in particular, uh, but the fruit of the spirit. It is in the list. Okay, so what we're talking about here begins to be the working of Christ and the Spirit in our lives to develop more Christ likeness. And it is tough. And if, <laughs> and if we're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit, guess what? True patience. Right, out the window. Yeah. right along with my sanctification, it's out the window. You're right. Yeah. It's in the dirt. In kindness. This speaks of, this isn't, isn't what we think of as being kind so much as it it speaks more of, of moral excellence in every area of life and character. There's a tough one. In every area of life and character. In the Holy Spirit, we're told walk in, in the spirit, not in the flesh. Um, walk in the spirit, give no place for the flesh. Uh, these kinds of, of things in other areas. And, and it's the idea of empowered by the Holy Spirit instead of self-will. Yeah, I, I could go off on a whole thing there too. But in genuine love, in genuine agape, in gen genuine high valuing of God and man. Non-Christians can spot a, a hypocrite from across town, really. <laughs> yep, that knee's not quite ready to, to, to quit fussing at me. Um, and... What does it do? It turns them off. And there are a number of people, even, even within my circle, who reject Christianity because of hypocrisy of Christians in the past in their life. And there is a difference between those who claim Christianity, maybe even saved, and those who walk by faith in a genuine loving, non-hypocritical way. There's a distinct difference. And may God always present me that way in spite of my flaws. Um, That's part, part of the way you live when you don't see your own flaws. Oh, I, I never get rid of my, my, my sin nature, and so, yes. And God's always going back and working on things and and will until the day I die. I, just last week, we, we talked about progressive sanctification. Okay? Um, I, I've got a long way to go. I really do. But each of us do. Um, however, we still have a responsibility when necessary to acknowledge faults and continue to show Christ in the, in the most positive manner possible. Um, by the way, if you want to look a little bit more into that, Romans 12 verses 9 through 21, I think really gives us a good, a good snapshot of what, what genuine love looks like. And I don't know whether you want, do you want to jump to that today or you want to, you want to just take that as a reference and kind of look it up on your own. At home.
them on your own. Okay, that's fine. It's Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Ah, yeah. So it goes right back into let love be without hypocrisy and goes through the end of the chapter. Um, verse 7. In the word of truth, the idea of speaking of the Bible and, in, and Christ himself. Remember, Christ is called the word. And throughout scripture, even Christ said, thy word is truth. But then he comes back and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so he is both. And I really believe this reference is both. So in the word of truth, taking this and accurately using it, because even Satan takes scripture for his own purposes. And when, and when you have people who don't do due diligence to it and don't use it the way God intended it, you can get it to say just about anything you really want it to. Um, yeah, that's a separate subject too. So in the word of truth and in the power of God. I do want to take a moment and point that out. You can say things that are biblical, in context, true, and not appropriate because they're said in, in the flesh and not, not in the power of God. If you're accurate in what you say and not timely and gracious in what, how you say it and when you say it, it can become a poor testimony. <clears throat> I think that's a very significant reason that he said in the word of truth and in the power of God because God's power and God's timing always make it graceful and gracious not so much Bill Hackett that works the other way around as well. how's that well we have seen people who say the words in the power of God and they absolutely believe it they believe that mm -hmm. it's the word from God and you know it's what they're supposed to do but they don't check it against you know the word of the scripture and if mm. it wasn't scriptural then it wasn't from God absolutely uh, yeah, that that even brings up a different a different kind of topic. But yeah, if you if you receive something from God and it doesn't line up with this, guess what? Done. Different sender. Yeah. Absolutely, it's easy to misunderstand. It is, not the word. and and yes, and other passages talk about trying the spirits. Okay, that again, that really gets off in, in quite a different subject, but you're right. You're absolutely correct. Um, no. Anyway, moving along. And in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. I understand, the way I understand this, I picture... A Roman soldier. I mean, speaking, trying to trying to go into the into the culture of it, and you have you you have different weapons. Okay, now primarily in in the in the Roman uh, armament, they have one primary uh, offensive weapon, and that is the sword of the spirit, not the sword of the soldier, by the way. But you, you have these other armaments, these other weapons that are designed as defensive, primarily, but have offensive uses. Take the shield as an, as, as an example. It defends, it protects the, the carrier 
against a sword thrust, a strike, whatever. Smack somebody in the nose with it and their nose hurts, though that becomes offensive, right? So someone who is well seasoned in fighting, first of all, that means that they've survived some things. Secondly, they've gained skill and they've done so by exercising what they need to do, okay? I, I really believe, and, and I see this in other passages of Scripture, Christians who are unseasoned in spiritual fighting aren't, f well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says we're not going to be given anything we can't handle. But we're not supposed to be the strength of our own, of our own so our source of our own strength. We're supposed to be doing it in Christ. So we come back to this whole idea of there are spiritual warfares going on around us all the time. And are we applying spiritual weapons or physical ones to it? Temporal or eternal? And I see here that these are the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. We got stuff in both hands. But you don't try and stab somebody with a, with a shield, do you? Well, I suppose you could try. But, right? <coughs> By glory and dishonor. You know what? We are to serve whether it makes us look good or looks, it makes us look bad. And there are times when it, we're doing what we should be doing the way we should be doing it in the power of God, and God will choose to allow it not to, to elevate us, not to come across always the right way. We wanted to have a little fun with it. Paul spent how many nights in jail? We don't know. Well, guess what? That didn't necessarily make him look good. Okay. By evil report and good report, we're, we're to serve in spite of those things. Remember, this is all about service of God. There, there, and there are many re conditions, 8B through 10, you know, regarded as deceivers and yet true. How many, how many, well, one of those Christians, well, you're just in it for the money. Well, there are a lot of them out there. I hate to say it. Mercenaries instead of ministers. But we can walk and minister true instead of being deceivers as unknown l l that's a present participle as being unknown and yet well known uh, yes and yet well known okay the idea there that really draws in the idea of humility whether you're well known whether you're not well known is irrelevant to the message because it isn't about us as dying, literally being in danger under the constant threat of death, and yet, behold, we are alive. This was a claim of Paul. Remember, the fact that he had not been executed was a source of encouragement to the Philippian church. As punished and yet not put to death, again, imprisonments, beatings, all of these things, and yet not dead. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We talked, I, I mentioned briefly the other day, the difference between joy and happiness. Okay, this, is, this draws into that. As poor in this world's goods, yet making many rich. Why? Because it isn't about the, the temporal, it's about the eternal. As having nothing material, and yet possessing all things spiritually. And we can see some of that in 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23, and Romans 8, verses 14 through 17. And I am going to stop there because we are out of time. Hey, I got through 10 verses. All right, yeah, moving along.
and we had some great discussion along the way. Thank you for that. Let's go ahead and close in prayer if there aren't any other comments. Nope. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. I ask that you would, you would use it, bring it back fruitful and not void. And I ask that you would bless the rest of this day today. In Jesus' name, amen.